Soraya, how's it going? All right, Jeff. How about you? I'm doing all right. You know what, Soraya? I have a stack, pretty big stack of records here <laughs> um, that I pulled out of my shelf that I wanted to flip through real quick and see um, if our audience knows the, the connection between all of these. Okay. So Romans, we've covered, yeah? Yes. And um, we might be covering again with um, a special guest. Yes. Um, Naked Prey. Okay. Remember, remember we uh, we talked about this one quite a bit with Van Christian and, and Ronnie, right? Um, human Hands. Yep. Uh, I have a one degree separation from the person that we're talking to because this came on the same label that my band was on, um, Nate Stark and his son, my band, White Glove Test from the 80s. So more Human Hands. Last weekend, we've talked about this, Danny and Dusty um, with Steve Wynn and Dan Stewart. Green on Red, which we are both very familiar with, a band that I include in the Pacey Underground, where it doesn't. <laughs> if not, they're definitely close. Plastic Land, um, a band that we've talked about um, digging into deeper. Um, yes. Um, B People. B so people. Mm -hmm, um, connected with... Um, Dennis Duck, there's a connection there with the LA FMS, I think they're called. Yeah. And of course, Dream Jeez. Syndicate, Ghost Stories, Dream Syndicate Out of the Gray. Um, this is a big hint right here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Dream Syndicate. And um, this is what Clive Jones thinks is their best album, if I'm not mistaken. Or is it a meal? One of the two. I think a meal. It could be both. So that's a some of the albums that I pulled out of my shelf that has something to do with who we're talking to today. So you want to let our audience know if they don't know already, because it's in the title. So <laughs> yeah. So today we have uh, the great pleasure of being joined not only by our guest host, uh, Ronnie Barnett, yeah. but we get to have a chance to sit and chat with Paul B. Cutler. Yes. And this beautiful piece of art because this album is art. Uh, he has a new solo album out called Les Fleurs. I'm so. glad you said that because my French is terrible. <laughs> well, Jeff, how about we get into it then? Come on, Paul, join us. Hi, this is Soraya. And this is Jeff. Our podcast is called Paisley Stage Raspberry and Rhymes. A podcast where the two of us play music that we like and share anecdotes and background about the tunes. We hope you'll join our conversation. And without further ado, agroviar. Let's get groovy. 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 Right. So, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so for our listeners, as we've mentioned, we have the great honor of having Paul, Cut Paul B. Cutler here with us. And Paul B. Cutler is not only a great musician, great producer, but Jeff, did you know, also an artist and graphic designer in his own right. So there were so many things I learned about Paul B. Cutler um, <laughs> that just expanded. So just welcome to the podcast and thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes. Cool. All I'm right. the extra guy, Paul. They have me along sometimes. My name is Ronnie, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yep. Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> so um, before uh, we jumped on here, Paul, I, we had a little introduction, and I was showing Soraya some of the stack of my records that have your name on it, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, i got a pretty massive record collection. <laughs> But your name is all over my record collection. There's all, all kinds of stuff. But um, that's not what we wanted to talk about today. <laughs> what we want to talk about is this gorgeous piece of artwork. I like doing this, Soraya. <laughs> it, trust me, you stare at it enough, it's going to start moving. But that's this, what it did for me. This album is just fantastic. It's just a gorgeous presentation. I, I haven't seen anything like this. The, the gold pressing. And look at this fine young man right here. Yeah, <laughs> it's just gorgeous. Released on in the red records this year, um, and Paul, we're curious because you've worked on music that's all over my record collection. Um, but I believe this is the first solo album. Um, in the liner notes, you mentioned something about 
Ryan Adams igniting the fire. Um, can you talk about why now and how this got started? Yes. Um, Ryan contacted me. Well, I, I was working at Golden Voice as their art director. AG Live as well. I was their art director. Ryan contacted me about doing some playing together because he liked my guitar playing. And uh, so we actually had a band for a very short time. Um, it imploded for reasons I'm not going to bother going into. Um, but he's a very, he's incredible. He's so talented, man. It's, uh, I've rarely met anyone like that. So he's a very inspirational person to work with. And uh, so after the band imploded, it hadn't fully imploded. It was kind of just put on hold and I just kept writing. I just kept writing and writing and writing. So most of the, almost all these songs come from that period. Oh, wow. And when, had, when had you not that? played, had you not picked up a guitar in a while, in a while Paul, before you kind of got, oh, no, got jump started there? Always, I was always playing. I, I mean, I don't know if you can tell, but somebody who hasn't picked up a guitar in a while cannot really do what I did on that record. <laughs> Good. Excellent point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's some fantastic guitar work on that. Soraya and I were just talking about that prior to jumping on this. There's some amazing guitar that work that's happening on this album. So when, when, what period of time was that when you and Ryan were doing that? Uh, it, in 2000, it started in 2014 okay. and the main writing of all these songs started in August of that year. And it only took me, uh, there's actually five more that just didn't make it to the record. I like them, but I just didn't have the strength to finish that many songs. There's 20 in total. Um, took me about, I don't know, the writing was so easy, man. I was just on fire and it took me about six months to write them all, something like that. Wow. Yeah. Now, now, what about the singing? Were, were you comfortable stepping into the uh, the, the lead vocalist role? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've never enjoyed singing that much, but uh, I mean, what you what you're hearing, uh, I did come up with that formula that I, I really like the whispered verses and the sung choruses. The first one I did was Decay, and uh, I just liked it. So I'm like, okay, that's what I'm doing. Um, and I, these are all, uh, as far as I thought at the time, these were just demos. I was just writing demo songs. So what you're hearing are actually pretty produced very quickly. Um, Basically, one of those songs would take me one weekend. That's it. Tracking almost everything except the rhythm section that I added later on. So um, the writing and the tracking would be one week. I would listen to what I had done musically on the way to work and just kind of get an idea for the lyrics. And uh, so it happened really fast. <laughs> All the vocals, you may or may not know what this means, but they're all recorded with a Shure 57, which would be the last thing an engineer would go for in a studio, because I thought it was a demo. Yeah, so that, that microphone is a microphone that's used quite a bit in recording, isn't it? It's Isn't it one of those Shure, I mean, sorry to use the word, but those Shure um, multi-purpose microphones? It's an amazing microphone for how much it costs. But if you were in a recording studio with a good selection of microphones, it's the last thing you'd pick up to record vocals with. It's amazing on like, it's great on guitars. It's great on snare drums. It's a $99 microphone, you know, and uh, it's an amazing wow. thing. And it's been great forever, but you wouldn't pick it to record vocals on ever. Right, it's mainly mainly like a live mic, right? Like for live shows. 
It's, it's a little dangerous for that. I used to mix ah. a Hong Kong cafe in the Sure 58 has that metal ball. It has a metal ball on the end. So when the person yeah. drops it, a 57 is just going to fall apart. Gotcha. But Soraya loves all this technical uh, stuff, by ah. the way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> They're the musicians. I'm the non-musician, yeah. so I'm learning. So thank you. Gotcha. But when it comes to lyrics, Soraya's all over it. Where that's where Ronnie and I step back usually. <laughs> so can we talk more about the recording? So Brad Lehner of Medicine and a bunch of other projects, um, Savage Republic, um, he um is credited as helping out in the producer role or co-producer role, I should say, which is really interesting to me because Paul, you are a producer uh yourself. So I was wondering why. Um, bring in somebody else to assist you when you're a producer yourself? Is it because it's your own work? It's very hard to, I'll use a metaphor. If you're a graphic designer and you want to design a logo for yourself, it's really hard, man. You have no, like, like it's just too, it, it, you're not, it's it just too hard to do it because you're going to do 50 versions and you're never going to figure out. So he came in basically at the mixing stage and um, I, it was just serendipity. I ran into him on Facebook. He's like, Hey, what are you doing? I'm like, Oh, I'll, I'll and I send him a couple of things. He's like, yeah, let me take a whack at it. And at that time, it was only going to be guitars and vocals. Oh, that's all that was recorded. And I was content. I'm just like, screw it. I'm just going to put it out there like this. I don't care. And uh, Brad took a whack at one of them. And the results were good. But then he said, you know, they would benefit from a standard rhythm section. I'm like, oh, boy. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was right. And that was one of his big contributions to the to being a, a co-producer on it is just urging me to go forward with bass and, and, and some drums. So um, I just feel so lucky I ran into him, man. And he's a tremendous mixing engineer on top of all that. He did a great job. Yeah. Uh, being familiar with some of the medicine recordings, I can hear his imprint on... So at least some of these songs it's like oh that sounds like some brad kind of production style in there but um um so soraya and i were talking about our favorite songs um fly away was one, our favorite one of our favorites that we did share and i'm really fond of the game also although um when i was listening to it and i got to the end and it kind of drops out and I immediately jumped up and thought the power went out. So <laughs> yes. You, you tricked him there, Paul. So. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um wh whose idea was it to do that? Whose <laughs> idea was what? The end of the game where Brad. That was oh, Brad. Okay. He actually had put it on another song to begin with. And I can't remember which one. And then I'm like, no, it doesn't work. But then once I heard the game, I'm like, yeah, that works all the way on that song. So that song um, ends, if you listen on the vinyl, which I do, um, inside B. So it's the end of the end of the record. So it was kind of, um, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it, was, it was startling <laughs> being there. I'll bet. Um, so, Paul, I'm a big fan of sequencing the records. Um, and um, I've been an album guy for decades um i prefer albums um as a whole versus singles um can you talk about sequencing this and how you went about um, the order of the songs it was the easiest thing i've ever done because i didn't do it brad did <laughs> <laughs> so was there any going back and forth or are you totally bought into there was only one thing i'm like that doesn't really fit there and he he and, and part of the thinking was, you know, let's get this thing cut at 45. Yeah. yeah. So we had a question about that, didn't we, Soraya? Yes. Okay, so we have to admit <laughs> that 
at first we listened to it as a standard long play. <laughs> I played it. I played it at thirty three, uh, and at, it's heavy. Uh, it got yeah. really, it's heavy got and really heavy. I, I mean, it takes you places. And then when we realized forty five. We wanted to know, was that a conscious choice? Because then it becomes the story of singles. Or did you just want to experiment with the speed? No, um, that was actually Brad's idea as well. And, you know, there's there's been precedent for that recently. I think there's been a few albums released recently at 45 RPM. Um, I'm told it, it just sounds better. That's what yeah. I heard too. Yeah, playing faster. I don't know. Yeah, pub, public images uh, metal box. That's how they did that one, so they could have. Oh, all they the reissued it at forty-five. Or, cool. or the the original version. Yeah, that was so. Yeah, fidelity is. I think it works on both uh, speeds, Paul. So you know, pick oh, your. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried sixteen or seventy-eight? Yeah. Yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seventy-eight might be a little different, but yeah, good idea. <laughs> good idea for everyone out there. Try to all speeds. Yeah. So when the album first started, I don't know if it was at 33 or 45, I heard a little bit of good times, bad times, especially with the percussion work. I'm like, oh, that's Zeppelin on steroids, especially when I started playing it at 45. Um, again, there was great guitar work. Um, and a lot of the content lyrically is pretty heavy and pretty dark at times. But I, Soraya, what was that lyric that you were sharing today that you really liked that was? You know, I, as uh, Jeff, uh, has mentioned I I like to listen to the lyrics and it was on persistence and there's a particular piece of the song uh, where you say if you're if you're cursed by the past and afraid of the future you are trapped in a maze that enslaves you and that just grabbed me and there's a lot of stories in all of these songs and uh I, this one in particular with persistence and then as you listen to the rest of the song it just it's pretty uh as a just someone listening it was impressive how quickly you just drew me into the story you wanted to tell and it was same same on decay same on uh, body shadow spirit uh, there were a number of songs where i think i had focused on you so much as a musician with an instrument and then here you show me these really great lyrics I, I mean I I think I'm just curious who influences you as a writer because you tell a very good story in all these songs um I'm influenced by you know tons of writers I've I've read quite a bit in my life uh zen poetry is a big influence on me. So I try to write where I want you to start thinking, but I don't want to tell you what to think. Oh. Um, that's my one of my big goals when I'm writing lyrics. Um, and I learned that from Zen poetry. Uh, you know, all the bunch of classic books uh, the lyrics, I worked really, really hard on the lyrics. I, 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 I like my lyrics to be based in philosophies. And I wanted the album to be gothic, first of all. I wanted it to be, there's like a triangle of philosophies. And down here would be nihilism. And down here would be Tao, and up here would be punk. There was like this pyramid I built of philosophies that I wanted everything to kind of flow forth from. But speaking specifically about persistence, I thought for many years that our linear um, perception of time is one of the biggest psychological problems that we have um the inability to live in the present so i'll tell you a story about a writer that influenced me in the preface to one of his books milan Kundera states and i think thought this was beautiful 
that when we were expelled from paradise, we were expelled into linear time with a sense of the past and the future. And that's how, that was our curse from, from that. And, you know, to me, the Bible's all about metaphors and stuff, but I, I like that take on it a lot. Wow. Thank you. That's very, very cool. So do you prefer writing music or lyrics or is it all more of a um, more holistic process? Um, the music comes a little easier to me because, you know, I just spent my whole life um, and I worked really hard on the lyrics but those lyrics are pretty much written in that week I told you about I would I would get in a kernel of an idea and I would I would listen to the uh, tracks in my car as I drove to work sometimes and just take little notes down and uh, so pretty much all the lyrics were written in that week okay. that I spent writing each song Wow. Yeah, I'm impressed. I, I am not good with words, either reading or or writing. So that's I love cool. writing. I, I seriously, I like writing a lot. And uh, I always have. Nice. So I have, uh, look, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I just want to talk about um, in the red records here. Yes. Um, yes. Did you always uh, envision? I, I know I know in the red put out the consumers record uh, years ago. So and I'm 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 an old friend of Larry, so I know what a great guy he is. But um, did you always see In the Red as the home for this record, or did you did you think of other labels? Or I never thought of other labels. What happened is I actually at one point just threw the demos with just guitar and vocals. I threw them on YouTube. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to get this out in the world. I don't care anymore. Um, and I sent Larry a link because you know we're friends and and he he's a cool record dude and he's like this would sound great on vinyl and I thought about that and I'm like wow he and he wanted to actually release it just guitar and vocals on on vinyl I'm like okay so I pulled it off YouTube like instantly <laughs> <laughs> and started thinking about how I was going to do that then luckily I ran into Brad and that ended that fleshed it out all the way gotcha speaking you could do a com you could do a companion release paul you could do the original demos now that the record has come out yeah you know, and maybe and it looks fantastic but thank oh, you oh yeah. you got c and d thanks that's right <laughs> yeah. I, it, to me this is this album is unique and uh and that's why i was curious about in the red because this is like, I was telling Jeff, to me, it feels like a very dynamic piece of art. And now that you mentioned about the speed, you know, I guess you can play it at any speed and it becomes a different album every time. <laughs> but also the artwork, the artwork starts to come alive and then you open and then you have, we're dealing with so many dimensions, you know, first, second, I mean, and then when you start tripping out and the music, the music will take you, you go to third and fourth but it's a lot of visual and then you have tactile was that purposeful when you were thinking of design to have so many different components i mean this is really unique and it's gorgeous it's absolutely gorgeous with the gold plating or the gold my design you know i was a designer for years um so it's something i'm pretty experienced at um when I started thinking about the packaging, it didn't take long to come to these conclusions. Um, I didn't know what the pop-up was going to be, but I wanted a pop-up because I dig those. Death Row um, what the one I think of. <laughs> I knew the inside I wanted a painting. I had a theme. Um, it didn't take me long and in you know i i was i've done a lot of specialized printing over the years working you know i worked on coachella for years so 
we got to do some pretty cool stuff for that. I wasn't it, aware it, of that until Soraya shared that today. So I didn't realize that you had worked on all, all those Coachella posters. I'd like to point yeah, out that so, this, sorry, just that the CD package is great too. Just yeah, I was wondering. You guys are talking about the LP, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The CD looks great too, Paul. Can, can you Thank open, you. open up the no, gate? Is it a gate? No pop up. No, no pop up on. Yeah, it's a gate pole. No okay. pop up. A la Jethro Toll stand up. That's what I think of when I. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry about that, Paul. You were, I didn't. Yeah. Get it um, so you had worked on the Coachella posters. Well, I I designed the logo for Coachella, and I designed mm. the original. Um, you know the mountains with the lineup written in the sky, like that part of the branding came from me. Oh. Um, because I was. I, I've worked on Coachella since the very first year. Um, so I did that for years. And, but during that, so I got a lot of experience being able to do some cool printing stuff. So I knew what was possible. So it made, made doing the album a little bit easier. Okay. And I, wow, I just want to, sorry, Ronnie. No, I no, I said the Coachella stuff, that's iconic at this point, right? I've never been to one, but the, yeah, like you say, the mountains and the letter, you know, everything. That's that's quite an achievement. It's Paul. been replicated and imitated <laughs> yeah. quite often. Yeah, and, and they're not going to change that at this point. So no. that's <laughs> it's it's synonymous with it. But I wanted to just add in, in as part of my research, uh, I came across a first edition promo that uh, Paul designed, and it's selling for, currently for two hundred dollars. I don't know who has it. But let me tell you, these Coachella posters, there's a very hot seller's market. Um, but uh, and people seek it out. So that first edition, you may maybe, you know, at the time you were wondering, oh, okay, maybe these posters will get up, maybe they won't. Uh yeah, that was a and that was just one site where I found it for 200. Right. Well, Amazing. you know, people like to remember their late teenage early 20s you know and they buy they also buy those silkscreen posters for like rocket from the crib or whatever all those th those that great series of posters from the 90s so yeah it's like a it's like a smell it reminds you of a time and place you know sure. music is like that as well oh absolutely yeah so uh, back to the design on this, Paul, um, knowing what you've said about some of your lyrics, um, is this the spiral image, is there a significance to that or is it more a, just an aesthetic thing? Is there... Something? It's an op art flower. The name of the album is The Flowers in French and it's an op art flower because uh, I've always loved op art. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Now, how are we doing on time? But we, we, we got to get a little bit into the past, Paul. Um, I, I mentioned the Consumers. Um, I'd always heard that that Consumers record was going to come out on Danger House, or it was supposed to. Is that true? Uh, they thought about it. They were... Um, I remember talking with Black Randy about it. They were kind of starting to struggle by the time they were thinking about that. So I just don't think they could get it together monetarily to do that. Gotcha. And then the band broke up and then that's why it sat around until Larry. Yep. And you rescued it in 1995. Okay. I recommend that record to anybody uh, watching the consumers great band. And then, and then when you read about the consumers, it always talks about violence at the gigs in Arizona. Um, is that cause you were, an early punk band and you're playing with uh normal unquote rock bands is that we were the first band uh, punk band in phoenix in arizona period wow. and you know arizona was a place of like i don't know it's i'm sure it's far different now i've been gone from there for so long but um it was the opposite of what you would call hip <laughs> <laughs> yes um 
and maybe still is. I don't really know, but um, yeah, there were there were they were not ready for. And, and, you know, they bought into the stereotypes. Oh, they're going to spit on us and they're going to do this and that. No, nobody did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my brother refused to take me to the class show because the opening band Legionnaires disease, he heard uh, the guy jacked off on stage. So <laughs> my brother wouldn't take me. I still have the full tickets. Yes. So <laughs> that's what was going on then. Yep. Um, Which is why you wanted to be front row, Ronnie. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, who came first, Vox Pop or 45 Grave? Vox Pop. Vox Pop started in 79, I believe. And, uh, you know, Vox Pop was not so much a band as just a concept. Like, we basically didn't care um, about anything. And, and this is an absolutely true story. We never, ever rehearsed together once ever wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was just this loose framework for us to be totally nutty and then during that time you know three of the members of 45 grave were in vox pop and and rob was a friend of ours who had been living in phoenix that we knew um so that started to come together like 1980 okay and then that kind of just took 45 grave just kind of took off. It, yeah, we got popular sort of, you know, within at least in LA. And uh, so we were doing that. Awesome. I have a couple of uh, questions based on what you're saying. Um, so you worked on some of our records that we've talked about before. <laughs> um, so with, and it has that Arizona connection. So was there a scene? Um, were, were you uh, working or did you play with Green on Red or Naked Prey? No, okay. no, I'm, I, that came later. They, okay. they moved to LA as well. Green on Red moved to LA and maybe they knew about me from Arizona, maybe not. I mean, they're from Tucson, I'm from Phoenix. Okay. And that doesn't seem like it's only 90 miles, but there is a pretty big difference between okay. those places. Right. Um, I think, you know, they probably knew more about me because I was already doing records in, in, in LA. Okay. So speaking about LA, Soraya, <laughs> something that we've been curious about that's been brought up on our podcast a few times, are these certain barbecues that, um, we believe we're hosted by 45 Grave members. Um, Chris Kakavez has mentioned it. Um, I think Van Christian had mentioned it also. Um, do you recall any events where you guys would get together and hang out and party in LA? Does this ring a bell at all? Well, with, <laughs> um, Green on Red were my neighbors, first okay. of all. They, yep. they live in the same apartments that we did for a while okay um i remember they thought we were pretty scary actually <laughs> um were they wrong <laughs> yeah they were because okay. we were f f uh pseudo scary you know we were having fun <laughs> um we weren't actually evil ex in, except to the extent that all of us are <laughs> <laughs> understood yep Great, great uh, quote. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So were there uh so would you guys get together and hang out and not work? that much really. We weren't really I, I partied, you know, I partied with Dan and the and the boys a little bit. Um, but I'll never forget this one time. They, <laughs> they were on mushrooms and uh I walked in and I could tell that it was not I <laughs> It was not a good thing for them at that particular moment for me to be there. <laughs> so I left. <laughs> yeah. You recognize that fact, though. That's good. Yes. Um, hey, speaking of your production, Paul, I got. I'm a big Plastic Land fan. I think Jeff is too. Um, cool. Now, now those guys seem like the real, the real thing. Like, um, and you made that record with them. I mean, are those guys? Those guys? They're that 24 hours a day, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, especially Glenn, yes. you know, um, he's, he's, 
he was minted that way i believe uh, <laughs> yeah that that was a neat band yeah yeah i i heard they like brought strobe lights in the studio and stuff is that is that true do they dress up the... no okay okay <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was at least not during our sessions okay. yeah and All can, right. I, can I add on one quick question just about Plastic Land? I read a quote, uh, it was quoted to you where you said the album came out and you said, and they went against everything I suggested. <laughs> Is that true? Or that maybe it was a misquote? I don't really understand that quote. I went against what? They went against like, everything. I'll, I'll, I'll bring up the quote. I'll bring up the quote. But yeah, it was it's something I read. I just was curious about so sorry. I don't know what there would be to go against. I finished the record and mixed it, and that was the record. And I, I, I would. I'm not the type of person that would give you tons of career advice. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> were, maybe the suggestions were in the studio, Soraya. Is that what it sounded it, like? It's possible, but again, I'm pulling up the quote so I can read it correctly. Okay. okay. <laughs> well. So, so, so Paul, when when the Dream Syndicate asked you to be the lead guitar player, I mean, are are you like obviously Dream Syndicate has an ex, they always have an explosive lead guitar player, right? And you were definitely that person. Um, were, were you? Did, did you relish that role? I mean, just being called on to let loose, basically let loose. Um, well, first of all, they didn't ask me to be their lead guitarist. I just heard they were auditioning people to be their lead guitarist. So I went to audition and I had mixed them and worked with them and stuff. And I thought they wanted a noise, just noise guitar. So I just did noise and I'm pretty good at noise. I can do noise <laughs> all day, you know? Yeah. Fred Frith was my last major influence. So um, that is something I do, but then the next, they brought me back and Steve said, you know, just play leads like Clapton or something. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the audition that got me the gig. Excellent. Nice. And I didn't really know what, I, I mean, I was only, I had mixed them live and I had produced that EP but I didn't really know that we were going to be doing these super extended jams and, and I was going to be, you know, wailing away for that much. Um, that was great, man. It was a real chance for me to stretch my guitar playing. Yeah, definitely. Because, uh, yeah, you you played leads in your other bands, but yeah, not, I mean, the dream is really stretching is a good word for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but it's fantastic. So Thank I you. Find that quote. I did, and I apologize. So it was a quote from a book called "Turn on Your Mind: Four Decades of Great Psychedelic Rock," and the quote was, "Cutler produced the 1985 record Wonder Wonderful Wonderland by Plastic Land, though purportedly, and this is where I made the mistake. Purportedly, his advice was quote generally ignored. So my guess is probably in the production, but that aside, that's not aside, true at well, all." Then, I'm glad we're able to correct it. It sounded, yeah. it sounded um, odd. But. We work together really well. And, you know, but I'm not a fascist producer. I'm not Mutt Langer. I'm not going to be like, <laughs> you know, Hell's you got to do yeah. X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, I work with, I, I always viewed my role as a producer as I was joining the band for that month or two. And I was just, a, I was another band member. I had a specific role to advise them with my opinions, but I'm I'm I was never fascistic about if if somebody had a strong and Glenn was the one that would have strong opinions. And if he really if I I'd be like, sure, yeah, cool. Nice. All right. I think we got about 30 seconds left before this shuts off. So I wanted to come back to this. So the floor is the new album by Paul Cutler. Uh, we definitely highly recommend it. 
Ronnie, I know your little package looks nice, but get the get the big one. <laughs> Take it easy, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> but, Paul, we wanted to thank you for coming on and, and giving us a little information on this. We really appreciate it. Very cool. Thank you. But again, thank you so much, Paul. We appreciate it. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolutely. Great record. Congratulations. Oof. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, so that was pretty cool. So Soraya, we've had Paul B. Cutler as one of our unicorn guests that we really wanted to talk to for quite some time. So I'm really glad that he put out this record because it was a great opportunity. And thank you, Ronnie, for jumping into a little bit of the past. We were a little apprehensive about um, bringing some of that up, but um, we definitely got to focus on this album, which is so gorgeous. It's like one of the best packaging um, records that I've seen in quite a while. It's now, as we talk, it's quite a piece of work. I mean, it's 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 long, it's dense. There's a lot going on. Like it's it's, you know, it's pretty amazing achievement. Let's, yeah, let's so face I, it. So. Yeah, I see the CD, so I'm glad that you held that up. I was wondering how how they uh, um, transferred that to a smaller medium. So yeah, it just doesn't have the pop up, but everything else it's embossed the gold and everything. It's, it's, it's the same like that. And, and obviously the, I can't, I can't change speeds on it, unfortunately. And the lyric uh, sheet, <laughs> it's, got, it's got the lyric sheets as well for both. Uh, it does. It does. It got a, I'll pull it out the booklet. Right. So each song gets its own page. Nice. Yeah. You nice. know, so yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I do want to say something. Yes. It's, I mean, these songs are dense and they're they've got all these dimensions and sounds to it and i was telling jeff here's where i see this punk spirit 15 songs in under an hour 15, <laughs> and he said there were five more that right. he just didn't you know didn't fit right now or didn't like enough to finish um, but uh, or you know didn't didn't want to finish them at that time. That's pretty baller. <laughs> fifteen in fifty one minutes. Yeah, it, 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 and also just taking in the music, it, it is pure Paul B. Cutler. Like like this yeah. could be a forty five Grave album if you had Dinah Cancer singing on it. You know what I mean? Like the music, it sounds it sounds like Paul. And um, right, that's interesting. I'm glad he talked about how he uh, evolved his approach to the singing thing um yeah that you know a, yeah and he was actually yeah. going for a gothic kind of vibe well yeah that's like, it's there oh yeah that's a that's a big he used to dress like a vampire let's face it i mean yeah uh, if you look at <laughs> i didn't bring this up but um in researching this and going through his discogs page um which is a website that ronnie as you know um uh, a lot of collectors put their uh, music collections on there and his little icon this is i think from the 45 grave days and it's pretty it's pretty scary <laughs> um <laughs> his um the amount of work that he's done i mean i just pulled up some of the records of my collection um when i was looking through the discogs page of the stuff that he's worked it's pretty deep he's he's worked on yeah. a lot of records and yeah this is just some of my you know my collection that he's been a part of whether it's production engineering um it's he's just been he's done a lot of stuff um yeah but yeah but all that to say that that little the little picture on discogs is a, a pretty <laughs> version so <laughs> but, well, like you said they were having fun you know yeah. dressing up and playing with all that gothic yeah. stuff and you know yeah i wonder if the goths uh are, you know don't like that that they weren't necessarily serious about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They I, were 45 grave. They could have done whatever the hell, and they did do whatever the hell they wanted. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Ronnie, I want that, to talk a little bit more about the guitar work. What What did you think about the guitar on this record? Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I, it's, it, it's weird. I've listened to this record several times and it's still, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, 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 there, I, it still hasn't all sunken in. I mean, I remember the first time I was saying, because you know, I didn't know what to expect really, and and you know, uh, when I think of him, I think of that explosive lead guitar playing, um, you know. And so at first I'm like, there's not, there's hardly any lead guitar on this, but you know, as you listen, there's plenty of lead guitar on this. I mean, he, uh, 
yeah, the, the, his guitar playing is like he said, you know, of course I've been playing. <laughs> I couldn't make this record if I wouldn't, you know. Can we talk for one minute about the song Istanbul? Yes. Uh, the guitar talking? work, the solos on Istanbul trip me up every time I hear it. His, you know, all I think about is how much time is he playing the guitar? I mean, obviously, I like the quote he gave us. He goes, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did on this album if I didn't play every day. Yeah. But that song really, I don't know. I don't know why it's Istanbul. Maybe because it's, I feel it's so different than the other songs. But some of the solos on that just, they're they are really they're really sharp and amazing. I don't know, just me. So, no, I think of this as a complete work. I, can, I, I don't have this piece together song by song. <laughs> I think of it as like one. one you know? Just like one big It could, it could have just had one, it could just be called, I don't want to mispronounce the title. I know. The album. <laughs> I had to have Soraya <laughs> say it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All my high school French and college French yeah, coming yeah. back in. Les no, no. It, and I, I mean that as a compliment, by the way. Too. Yeah, yeah. It, so it's a, it's a, I like my first reaction was this is a, I told Jeff this is a vibey record, but yeah, it's yeah. just there's so many dimensions, and then to hear him talk about his own writing, and that triangle nihilism, yeah. Dao, and then punk. Yeah. Yes. You know, yes. I thought I, I said. <laughs> succinctly said and perfectly said Incredible. because that's exactly it and I think like I think back to when I first knew about 45 grade I was in junior high and I so I have that vision of 45 grade in my head and then you follow him through other projects not only as a musician but as a producer and then to find out that there's this other piece this art piece, this graphic design, visual art piece of this. And then for him to give me this, I'm like, I had no idea who, I think I had one idea of Paul B. Cutler and what I'm living right now through is a completely different one. And it's, it's good that way. Yes, for to be your first solo album and have it be a, com a complete photo, that's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and and um, again to bring up Larry in the red, uh, that not every label would have done this package. You know what I mean, Larry? Uh, There's Lair so much to this. Lair Larry's the best. Yeah, yeah. So he understands this kind of thing and under obviously understood it needed this kind of package and and because this isn't cheap. No, uh, these things are not. Yeah. So, uh, Ronnie, are you aware or? would Larry know how many of these LP sets have been printed? Because just the pop out and the artwork yeah. plus the colored vinyl, plus the lyric sheets, plus all the gold, um, yes. the, you know, the gold on black, these, yeah. this is expensive to print. Exactly. Any idea how many of these vinyl sets are out? Uh, I don't know, but um, you know, everything's a limited edition. So I have sorts. Even Thriller. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, we could find out. But yeah, I mean, um, you know. Because yeah, yeah. this is an expensive piece. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. Yeah. And then and then it's not ref a lot of these labels, like a lot of the record store day stuff you see is like 40 bucks, 35. This record is still reasonable, pr pr reasonably priced if you go to In the Red. I mean, I want to say it's 25 bucks. Um, so, it's you know. Crazy. It, and the CD presentation have it be a mirror of the LP, you know, without the pop out, but pop up. But still, yes, yes, it's not in a jewel case. It's kind of slightly oversized, even which is uh, fine. Yeah. Um, yep, and it's still. Ooh, that, still get that flower. I'm trying to do what you did, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this is wild, man. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, he is great. Thanks for having me along, as usual, you guys. Well, you always guide us in the right direction. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Ah, you know. <laughs> I do my. Some days are better than others, right? 
<laughs> well, this was a great one. Thank you so much for joining on the call. Yeah, and, no. uh, being here, but I'm s- woo! absolutely. Ooh, child. Ooh, Jeff. That's pretty awesome. First of all, big thanks to Paul B. Cutler and to Ronnie Barnett. Yes. But wow. Did we just hang out virtually with Ronnie Barnett and Paul B. Cutler? We did. We did. We did. And we learned about the triangle. Yes. Funk, nihilism, Tao. Live your life by that. That's pretty awesome. That's very awesome. Uh, That was, I really, really enjoyed that talk. And I, you know, I feel like we're barely scraping the surface of who Paul B. Cutler is and what his art means to him. Agreed. Yeah. I feel like, uh, and there's a duality in one sense. I feel like I know Paul a little bit more, but it, it seems like it re- opened up a lot more where there's so much more to learn at the same time. So it's a, um, but that was great. And talking about this record was a lot of fun. So in the red put this out this year, early 2023. Yeah. Les Fleurs. Les Fleurs. Yes. Yeah, go, go get it. Um, let us know what you think, but, Yes, and yes. you know, Jeff, you and I love to hold on to hope that more is coming. And when Paul said there are five songs that didn't make it onto this album and that he's really, when he gets inspired, he'll write and he's constantly working on his, on, you know, working on the guitar. Who knows? Maybe this just, this just was the first foot through the gate of solo work. Maybe. Or a five-song EP. I'm good with that, too. <laughs> so. But, uh, yeah, that that was that was fantastic. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad we got to speak with another unicorn. Agreed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I hate to say it, but mi gente, agruviar. Groove on, Paisley people. <laughs> you ever see that non record that had like different holes in it like you had one in the center but they so the record would speed up and slow oh. down oh. yeah yeah <laughs> some i work in a record store sometimes we play 45s with, with off center like that just uh, slightly off it's got to be just slightly off center but yeah it, it creates that <laughs> like a warbly sound i would yes <laughs> very cool you guys are great, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Paul. This thank is you. this is fun. It's an honor. I know you don't do too many interviews. Um, thank you so, so much. Thank you.